Our speaker now is someone I had never met till he arrived. But I know he comes with a heart that loves the Lord and loves his church. Nick Perez was born and raised in California, and he's an alumni of, of, of here at SIBI and from 07. Married to Kim, and they have three sons, Ezekiel, Deacon, and Zachariah. I don't know which has the mohawk, but Zachariah's got the mohawk. My kids used to love him. Right now, he's preaching in Modesto, California uh, at the Davis Park Church of Christ. Nick holds a bachelor's degree from SIBI, a bachelor's degree from Amherst University, a master's degree from SIBI, in, and the, University of Amer- uh, the Theological University of America. And he has a master's of divinity from theological, uh, master of divinity in theology from, from Liberty University. Wow. He loves to study. We'll be blessed by that. I know. He enjoys reading, writing, and fr- frequently going to the gym. I don't know much more about Nick, but I am positive that we will be encouraged by what he has to say. Because you can't love the Lord and love his church without speaking God's truth. Nick, if you'll come up here and join me, we'll pray and then you can preach, with, preach to us. Father, we love you. We praise you for the life of Nick and his family as they minister and teach and preach your truth. Let us see that tonight through his message about the true preacher of Christ. Father, thank you. Speak through him. As through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Nick, preach the word. Thank you, brother. I bring you greetings from the fourth largest mission field in the Western Hemisphere, the People's Republic of California. <clears throat> The church is facing times that for us are unprecedented. We've had to learn to adapt to a number of things, and I'm sure you can identify with that. A number of trials have come our way as a result of the coronavirus. I'm sure you, like us, have attempted to navigate those waters in a way that is pleasing to the Lord in a way that is beneficial to the church. And for that, I give you thanks. And I thank our Father for your efforts. Turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 21 through 43. Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. This will be our text this afternoon. Hear now the word of the true and living God. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus And came up behind him in the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, 
came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the father's child and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we sit before your word, and we pray that as we see the life of Jesus, you would, by your Spirit who lives within us, enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can see the preacher in trials. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Not long ago, I was talking with a member of the congregation, and I don't remember exactly the context of the conversation, but they said to me, we don't get out of this life without something happening to us. And they said a mouthful with that. It's similar to, in some ways, I suppose, cake. When you want to make a cake, you get all of the ingredients together. And, you know, I wouldn't eat a stick of butter by itself. That's not something that appeals to me. But you you put the butter into the mixing bowl. And then the flour, you have several cups of flour. and, And by itself, I wouldn't eat a couple cups of flour. But I'd put it in the mixing bowl and and then the sugar, well, you know, I, you know, maybe sample a little bit of it, right? But I wouldn't eat a whole cup of sugar. But you put it in the mixing bowl as well, and, and you mix all of the ingredients together, and, and at the end of it, you have cake batter. Yum, right? One of my favorite pastimes is to lick the spoon. Anyone else? A spoon licker? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's great, but, but here's the thing. I wouldn't eat a whole bowl full of cake batter. Maybe you would, not judging, right? I wouldn't do that. It doesn't appeal to me. What do you do with the cake batter? You pour it into a pan, and then you take that pan, and you put it in the oven at a high temperature, and it bakes for a while, and then out comes cake. My wife does marvelous things in, in taking all of those things, mixing them together, and out comes something good. Hmm. So many things happen to us. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Individually, we may not be able to assess them on their own merit, but they all go into the mixing bowl of our lives. And they they get mixed together, as it were, and, and, and then God will sometimes, occasionally, turn up the heat. Not because He's capricious or evil or mean, but because he's up to something in our lives. He's taking all of those seemingly random things, even the things that have bad written across them in big bold letters, B-A-D, bad, he puts all of that together and he's at work for good for those who love him in all things. We need to know that our trials 
the trials that we go through, the things that have bad written across them. God is using those. God uses the bad things. In fact, God, we could say it this way, He permits various trials to befall us for His holy purposes. What are some of the trials that we face? Well, here in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43, we see Jesus facing several trials. And in fact, we've been set up for it. If you read through the Gospel of Mark, Mark seeds the narrative of his Gospel in such a way that we see Jesus facing a number of trials all along the way. It starts all the way back in chapter 2 and verse 6, where Jesus there tells a paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you, and that causes some quiet questioning within the hearts of his opponents. Who's this guy think he is? Who is this guy? Only God can forgive sins. Ding, 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 but they missed it. And then Jesus has to set them straight. And let me show you, I have the authority to forgive sins, and he causes the paralytic to walk. It's a trial, this quiet questioning from his opponents. A little later on in chapter 2 and verse 16, this time the opponents vocalize their questions, and it's not directed to Jesus, though. They, they question his followers, and they ask, well, why is it that your master eats with sinners? That is, he fellowships sinners. Another trial. And once again, he sets them straight and says, look, I, it's not the well, the healthy, that need a physician. It's the sick. Hmm? You guys getting it? They weren't. And then just the next verse. Now you have some people. It's just some of the common people. Were they motivated by the opponents of Jesus, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees themselves? Mm, don't know that. Maybe. But they ask, hey, well, Jesus, why is it that John's disciples, the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't? Another trial. More opposition. By the end of chapter 2, we have yet another trial. This time, it's the Pharisees specifically questioning Jesus, finally directing their questions to him directly, and they're asking about his disciples who've been going through the fields of grain and rubbing them together and then popping the grain in their mouth, and why are they violating the Sabbath, Jesus? Why are they violating the Sabbath? And he has to set them straight and say, don't you know who I am? Lord of Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. They've got it all twisted yet again. Chapter 3, you get to verse 6, and you have the Pharisees with the Herodians, not exactly simpatico with one another, but they're coming together plotting, trying to figure out, how do we kill this guy? we we got to get rid of this guy. Later on in chapter 3, you have some of the uh, scribes, those who came down from Jerusalem, who are saying... <laughs> This guy, he's possessed by a demon. It's by the prince of demons, by Beelzebul that he casts out demons. More opposition about the, the nature and the source of his power in his ministry. Even before that, in verse 21, you have his own family who they think he's crazy. He's lost his mind. He's second cousin to Harvey the Rabbit, right? We got we to gotta go take charge of this guy, bring him home and, you know, try and rehabilitate him a little bit. They thought he was out of his mind. And even here, as we come back to chapter 5, right before the narrative that we're coming to this afternoon, Jesus heals a demoniac who had legion in him. Remember that? And the townsfolk, when they hear about this, come out and they beg him to leave. They reject Jesus because he's bad for business because the pigs went off the cliff and all that. Jesus please, pretty please with sugar on top, get out of here. They rejected him. Mark's been setting us up all along the way. And now we come here to an account from the life of our Lord that I think is fairly familiar. I think we know it. Jesus is approached by a ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, come and help my daughter. She's about to die. And Jesus goes with him. But on the way, He's got a bunch of crowds that are just pressing in on him and, 
And, and the, the idea there is there's, there's hardly any room to walk. And here comes this woman who has a, a serious medical uh, disorder, and she comes up, and she thinks, she's heard of what's been going on with Jesus, and she thinks, if I can just touch his garment, things are going to go well. I, I, I'll be healed, which is what she does, and she is But Jesus perceives power has gone out from him. This is the parallel account in Luke. When Jesus starts looking around going, who touched me? He explains to his disciples, I felt power go out from me, which is a fascinating thing. Because this is God the Son who has veiled his deity with his human nature for a time. And as God, the Son no doubt has unlimited, infinite power. It's like a few weeks ago, we took our annual trip to the beach. We go out to the Pacific Ocean, to Pismo Beach, and you go out to the water, and if you just take a spoonful of water, have you really diminished the ocean? Or, or maybe it's kind of like, you know, when you, you light a candle and, and the flame is there, and you can actually use that candle to ignite another candle, but you haven't diminished that flame by, by starting another flame. You don't diminish it, and that's That's the nature of divine power. It's infinite. And yet Jesus, who touched me? I I felt power go out. The disciples are incredulous, Lord. Crowds are pressing in. and Everyone's touching you. What what do you mean someone touched me? Finally, when the woman could not keep it to herself, she came forward and she told the whole truth. And Jesus affirms her, daughter, your faith has made you well. And that can also be translated as saved you. The term there, pulling double duty, go in peace. Be healed of your disease. While Jesus is blessing her, here comes some from the ruler of the synagogue's house. Sorry, she's dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. He's got other business to do. And Jesus ignores that and do not fear, only believe. He goes to the house. She's not dead, she's only sleeping. <laughs> Who is this guy? Get him out of here. They laugh at him mockingly. That's the the term that's used there, mocking derisive laughter. And then he takes just a private group into the room, touches her hand to Letha Kumi, and she gets up, raised from the dead. Don't tell anybody. Again, it's an account that we're familiar with. We've no doubt heard it before. But what are the trials that Jesus faces here? Just a few. One, let's call it the trial of popularity. Jesus is immensely popular at this time. Back in verse 21, a great crowd gathered about him. It's, this is repeated in, at the end of verse 24. A great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And again, the, the, the force of the language is, it's like the people are on top of Jesus. They, they can't get enough of him. And they're just, they're pressing in and it's hard to even move about because the crowds are thronging, pressing in about him. Myriads of fawning followers. Jesus, he's here. And despite that, there are only two who actually draw near to Jesus with a deep sense of their need, a real need. Ruler of the synagogue, who comes on behalf of his 12-year-old daughter, right? And this woman who has this serious medical condition. It's a trial of popularity. Myriads of followers. Lots and lots of people coming around. But only two coming with that deep sense of need. Hmm. And then there is, let's call it the trial of unbelief. And this takes many different forms in this account. The first may be with the disciples. I mean, the text, all it says is that they said to him, there in verse 31, it doesn't say that they rebuked him, but the nature of the question is such that they're incredulous. (laughs) What? What are you talking? The crowds are pressing in around you, and yet you say, who touched me? Come on, Jesus. Incredulity. They they can't believe it. What do you mean? Then there's the some who come from the ruler of the synagogue's house. Down in verse 35, 
Your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher? There's nothing he can do about it. Just let him move along. Again, more unbelief in whether or not Jesus can do anything. And even if we want to explain these away with the disciples and with those who came from the ruler, uh, rulers, uh, ruler of the synagogue's house, you still have verse 40. They laughed at him with that mocking, derisive left. <laughs> who is this guy? Where'd you get him? Serious? Get him out of here. Unbelief. Popularity. Unbelief. And then this third one, and I'm just going to call it the grave effects of sin. Jesus is the sinless Son of God. Even God, who came down, took on flesh, dwelt among us. He took on a human nature to himself. And in the New Testament, it is affirmed again and again, in him there is no sin. He committed no sin. Tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Again and again. 1 John chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. No sin. Sinless. And then he steps onto the grand stage of human history as a man. He enters into his own fallen creation and he's surrounded by sin and sinners everywhere he looks. For centuries, for millennia, sin had worked its destructive work in the children of Adam. Paul talks about this in Romans 5 and verse 12, that sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. In other words, it wasn't supposed to be like this, but because of sin, it is. Death, sickness, disease, all of it came to all people. Great, small, high, low, doesn't matter. In this text, we have two females. One, a little girl, who may be of some means. Her daddy's the ruler of the synagogue. And then this woman, who simply by virtue of the fact that she is a woman, is already, has a certain status in that culture and society. But then she has the discharge of blood that renders her ritually, ceremonially unclean. She's an outcast, pushed to the edges, the margins of society. And yet neither the 12-year-old girl or the woman with the 12 years of the discharge of blood, neither one can escape the grave effects of sin in their lives personally. And again, this is a trial that our Lord faces as the sinless Son of God surrounded by sin in a sin-stained world. So then what does this have to do with us? What are, what are these trials? What do they have to do with us and the trials that we face? They're similar, but different. Let's take the trial of popularity. A well-known preacher once told me, bigger is not necessarily better, it's just more. I praise God for the sphere of influence I have in the corner of the world where I live. And at the same time, I praise God for my brothers who have a larger platform, who have a larger sphere of influence. That's a good thing. But here's the thing, you may have hundreds, thousands of followers on Facebook and Twitter. You may have a lot of people who read your blog or listen to your podcasts. You may have a lot of viewers on YouTube. But the trial remains the same. We see it here in the life of our Lord, who I think we can agree was the greatest preacher to ever walk the planet. Lots of people, many people draw near, but there are precious few who know their deep sense of need. We have that today. Many draw near, but few know their deep sense of need. Flip it the other side, on the spectrum of popularity, if we want to talk in such terms. You may be sitting there going, well, actually, 
I don't have very many friends on Facebook, and I don't write a blog, and I don't have a podcast, and YouTube, what's that? And in fact, where I'm at, there aren't a lot of people at the church that I serve, and quite frankly, there aren't many people coming. There's, there, there aren't any that are drawing near, it seems. And I would remind you, my brother, do not forget where this narrative leads. Where does the life of Christ lead? To the cross. The Son of God dying with cold steel in His hands and in His feet. And how many followers are there again? Hmm. We still face the trial of popularity. We still face the trial of unbelief. We preach a gospel that says that our Creator, the eternal Lord of glory, entered into His creation for a time and was killed by His creatures for their salvation. And you may preach this gospel with all the eloquence and elocution that God can give the preacher, and the world is still going to look upon it. Those who are perishing are still going to hear it and think, folly. Nonsense. That's moronic. Don't take my word for it. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly. We get our English term moronic from that, moria in the original. It is folly to those who are perishing. We still face a world of unbelief. The greatest preacher to ever walk the planet came to his own and was rejected by them. They nailed him to a cross for it. Even here in this account, the good news of his resurrecting power, not dead, only sleeping, is met with, <laughs> get this guy out of here, mocking, derisive laughter. And we, and then we look at ourselves, who, who are we? We, I'm, I'm a clay jar, and I have this immeasurable treasure within me? No wonder Paul asks, who is sufficient for these things? I hear you, Paul, and I'm right there with you. And then there's, we know about the grave effects of sin, don't we? For 2,000 years, since the time of our Lord, sin has continued its devastating work among people. And it is inescapable that we face the misery that sin brings with it to the human race. People will suffer for a decade, maybe 12 years, say, with a particular disease. We know they sit in your pews. There are people that suffer their entire life with a disease. We know about the children who die. Again, their, their parents sit in your pews. And every Sunday, you stand up and need to give them a word of hope when a light has been extinguished in their lives. Sin has caused... All of this, the, the sickness and the disease. How about even new diseases? Hmm? Novel coronavirus, anybody? COVID-19? That's not part of the original good, even very good creation of our God. Sin is the cause of all this pain and disease and death in this world. Our God, He created His world good and very good, and it is sin, nothing but sin, that has brought so much pain and suffering. Every debilitating disease, every withering weakness, every unbearable pain, every humiliating betrayal of body and mind, all of it we owe to sin. And it boggles my mind, brothers, that we play at sin. It boggles my mind preacher, elder, that we would play at sin. Church, it boggles my mind that you would continue in your sin, knowing the devastation. We need to marvel that people love their sin, the very thing that enslaves them, not join with them in it. We need to recapture the holy call of Psalm 97 and verse 10. Let those who love Yahweh hate evil. Preacher, elder, deacon, member, church. 
Let us hate sin with a holy hatred. Now, that was a good place to say amen, but... Now, we need to hate sin with a holy hatred. And this bleeds into our response to the trials that we face. Well, what do we do then? We do face these trials. Just a few things, and the lesson will be yours. Number one, we need to respond with faith. Look again at what our Lord says in verse 36 to the rule of the synagogue. Do not fear, only believe. It's not a tall order, and yet it is, isn't it? To respond with faith. Faith in God, faith in Christ. By faith, we begin this enterprise we call Christianity. By faith, we live. By faith, we stand. We walk by faith, not by sight. By faith, we overcome. By faith, we have peace with God through Christ. Faith in the midst of trials. And yes, it will be by faith that we enter into eternal rest. Only believe. Those are the words of our Lord, of our Savior to us. Only believe. Let me just ask then, do you? Do you really believe? Or are you just pretending and playing at this? Do you really believe? The second thing is, and it's not specifically in this text per se, but again, Mark's been leading up to it with this. And it is, let's call it a strong sense of identity. Mark's built this in. We go back to chapter 1 and verse 11. When Jesus is being baptized, he comes out of the water, the heavens open up, and the Father says from heaven, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the beloved Son of the Father. You go deeper, and he's the Son of Man who has the authority to heal and forgive. He's the Lord of the Sabbath in chapter 2 and verse 28. He's, get this, ready? He's Son of the Most High God, and it's demons in chapter 5, verse 7, who recognize this. Who is Jesus? He's all of these things. And so, let me just ask, who are you, my brother? Strong sense of identity. And, and it, it starts with recognizing, I'm, again, I'm a clay jar. I'm a pot in the potter's hand. And I, I feel my own weakness and my own shortcomings. And yes, that is right. But do not forget, again, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, this time verses 27 through 29. Listen carefully. He says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Do you hear? God has chosen you. He's chosen you, preacher. He's chosen you, elder. He's chosen you, church member. Even though we are these weak creatures of dust, foolish, low and despised, yeah, but God's chosen you. Now that is not a license to then pop your collar and walk around like you're somebody. Yeah, God's gift to the church. That's me. Aren't you glad to have someone like me? God forbid that such arrogance mark the Lord's body. No, but God chose you. Strong sense of identity. And then one more thing, and I admit I got this from someone else, another preacher, but it's called good God moments. This is where you look for the moments in your life and in your ministry when God shows up and when he shows out. A couple of years ago, the leadership team, the elders and the ministers where I am, we were we were going through a trial, and that's about all the information I want to give about that, but suffice it to say, there was one particular thing that was drawing a lot of our attention and our focus during our leadership meetings. And it's a, it was a particular thing that was just, it was, it was draining, it was spiritually draining on the leadership team. I happened to go to a conference, a one-day conference, where I heard this minister share this idea. I brought it back. I said, fellas, what if we, we have these meetings where we spend all this time on this particular thing and it can be draining? What if at the end of our meetings, 
we had some good God moments where we just went around the table and we shared just the good things that our good God is doing in the church. I'm going to tell you, when we implemented that, yes, we still had to deal with the trial. We still had to deal with that spiritually draining thing. But at the end, man, we left on a high note because we were seeing all of the good things that our good God was doing even in the midst of the trial. It may be something as simple as that beloved sister in the congregation who's been a Christian nearly all her life. And she'll tell you, she's been a Christian nearly all her life. And it's a Sunday and maybe you've gotten up there and you've preached a sermon that it just it didn't land. And you're feeling particularly low and you're standing at the door and you're doing your duty of greeting people out the door, right? And here comes this sister, seasoned veteran of the faith, and she comes up to you and she grabs your hand and she looks you in the eye and she says, you're the best preacher that I've ever heard in my life and I've been a Christian nearly all my life. And then you start going through the mental Rolodex of all the preachers that have stood in that pulpit where you were and you know they were known for preaching the gospel. And she just, ah, she gives that to you. That, and in fact, it's not even her, is it? That's the Lord working through the sister to lift your head and buoy your spirit. It might be the alcoholic father whom our God has given a new heart and has abandoned his alcoholism and is now doing his best to be a conduit of God's grace to his children and his grandchildren. Oh, it's, that's a good God moment. It doesn't have to be some big grandiose thing. Just these good God moments that you see and you can, you can grab onto and you can, even in the midst of the trial, it's right here in the text, isn't it? The Father gives to his beloved son a good God moment. On the way to see this daughter who's dying comes another daughter of Israel. And she's healed. Verse 34 captures it. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's a good God moment for the Lord Jesus. And even for us today, no one is beyond the reach of trials. Jesus, the sinless one, the sinless son of God, he proves it to us. Even he's not immune to trials in this sin-stained world. There are so many, so many in this world. So many trials due to sin. And then we turn inward and we see our work and so often it seems so small, so insignificant. Our best efforts to glorify God through our service, they just, they're weak. They're imperfect. Our love wanes. But as I close, I just want to remind us we were dying of a disease and our God saved us. We were lost and He found us. We were blind and He, he made us see. And yes, we were even dead in our trespasses and sins. But God made us alive in Christ Jesus. And so, my brothers, my sisters, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let us commit this to prayer. Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. We give you praise that you have created us and recreated us in Christ Jesus. We grieve and lament at the trials that we face in this world. We put our trust and our faith in you, knowing that you have called and chosen us for the glorious work that is set before us. And so enable us to keep our heads up and to find and see those good God moments. 
where you are active and at work in our lives and our ministries. I ask a special blessing now upon every preacher, every elder, every deacon, every member of the Lord's church that is here. Walk with us, Father, day by day. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.